how's it going everybody welcome back for those of you who joined me earlier today for a live stream it's really fun to do two of these in one day um, so if you don't know me I'm Steven Malin I'm a music composer and I work in a lot of different mediums and genres and so today we're actually talking about a track that I just produced for a podcast series called dark dice it's been a lot of fun working with that team. Um, so for those who don't know about audio dramas, it's a type of fantasy podcast that takes advantage of kind of the, the best of both worlds of the fantasy realm, meaning, you know, sound design and custom music, but also the narration and the storytelling of things like movies. Um, and so uh, it's kind of this emerging genre, which is really cool and totally fun to... Uh, kind of have a lot of freedom and a lot of uh, free reign to be creative and experimental with music. So this track is no different. So this is gonna be a really short stream today, about 15, 20 minutes, and the purpose of this today is to show you guys two things. First and foremost, how I mixed a massive, what I consider to be a massive amount of instruments that were all live recording. So we're talking 30 plus instruments that were just kind of assimilated from different musicians from literally around the world. We had a Hungarian choir that we recorded. I played a bunch of instruments in my studio. We had um, a European medieval um, string player who played hurdy-gurdy and lutes and dulcimers and all this crazy stuff. And we had a cello player, um, another another guy, friend here in, in the States. And we put all these things together into one session and then the challenge was to actually create an effective mix that made some sort of sense. Um, so I want to kind of go under the hood today of how on earth I did that. But then the second portion of this, I want to spend a few minutes talking about how I set up my buses and my routing to where with one click of a button with the record button within my DAW, which is Pro Tools today, how I instantly was able to live record every single track, every single instrument as its own dedicated stem to deliver to the creative team so that they have 100% control at the end of the day of how they want to maybe uh, refashion and and you know make their own music out of these stems, which is a whole another level of creativity, which is uh, a lot of fun. So I know a lot of you guys wonder how to do that. I certainly have wondered how to do that. Um, kind of preparing even for this video going into this. It's a newer thing that I've done, um, but it's a lot of fun. So um, kind of another exciting bit here is today we are in Pro Tools. Um, and for the very first time today, I'm able to stream live from Pro Tools because I have to show you this. Um, I've been having this debate with, with composers and producers for years about how, what a bummer it is that there's no good solution to stream audio directly from Pro Tools, but I finally figured it out. Um, a lot of you guys know that I use the Voxingo Recorder plugin, which is streaming right now, but what you don't know, whoopsies, uh, but what you don't know is that I, um, there, there's never been a, a clean and effective way to record directly for Pro Tools because it's an AAX with Pro Tools 11 and 12, um, the types of plugins we use. And so my hope today is that this is something that can be a solution for a lot of you guys who stream. Um, essentially, it's this uh, plugin called DDMF Meta Plugin, and it's kind of like VE Pro where you can uh, load any plugins that you want. And so as you can see, it has my full list of, plugin, of VSTs on my machine. And then you just kind of click and drag it into the interface here and you connect audio input to audio output and turn it on. That's it. And then that allows my machine to detect the audio and then you can hear exactly what's happening within Pro Tools, which I think is amazing. Um, what a simple solution. Um, and it's a pretty inexpensive solution as well compared to some other uh, audio routing apps and things which just get way too confusing. So yay, this allows me to live stream very easily in the exact same format using the same plugin I use on my other DAWs. Uh, so it's, it's a ton of fun. Um, so that's kind of how you're able to hear what's going on today. So as far as the mixing goes, so part one here, the mix itself. The first thing I do when I, when I have live instruments um, and even if I have MIDI instruments, I will export the MIDI instruments into audio files. So if I'm gonna do mixing, I need to have audio files to work with. So what I do is I go into Pro Tools, Control Shift I, and that opens up my interface so I can 
uh, select the WAV files, and then I import them. So anytime you import within Pro Tools, your audio files go into your clip list, which is this over here. And then you can actually click the region if you want, and it'll highlight that specific item in the clip list. And then you can do some fancy things like right click and uh, export that clip as a file if you'd like to. Um, but what I like to do is when I get a new session, I import all my audio files into the clip list. And that way I can create my own channels individually. So in this case, I'll hit control shift in for new tracks and I'll create the number of audio tracks, stereo audio tracks that I need. So in this case, I needed like 30 something. So I just type that number in and it creates all of these clean stereo audio files on the left side. And so what I can do from there is if um, I go in my top left hand corner here, if I shuffle on my computer keyboard, if I hit the little tilde key, the top left, I can shuffle between these four options. So I actually like the, shuff the shuffle option because I can click any of my audio files in the clip list. And once I click and drag it, it will actually insert that audio file directly into the start of whatever space is in that audio track. So it's just a really fast way um, to get your clips exactly where they need to go um, without messing up your, your order of your channels. Um, so I've, I've, I've just found that to be incredibly fast to, to get things where they need to go. The second thing I do before I ever even touch a, a fader is I will go through and I'll take something that might otherwise look like this, where it's just a bunch of silence. I will go through and I will actually delete all of those little silences. And up here, I can toggle between my tools by hitting escape on my keyboard. You can see how that it's shuffling. So I like to go to the option that selects these three items here. And that allows me at any point to click on an item or to take my toolbar here and to drag. And so what I can do is go through and select and actually go through and, and delete all the bits of silence for each of the tracks. It takes about five minutes, but it's well worth doing in order to make sure that what I'm seeing is what I can edit. That helps me a lot visually because within Pro Tools, I can go into any audio region, such as this one little accordion bit, and I can increase the volume or decrease the volume. And I have complete control over just that one audio region, which is tremendously helpful um, at certain parts without the track. If I just wanna hear a little bit more of that one instrument or a little bit less of that instrument, it's highly, highly valuable. Now you can certainly do all of these things in any DAW, but I specifically like Pro Tools for mixing because of these batch edit functions. So that's why I'm really picking on Pro Tools today. And that's why I recommend you guys pick it up at some point as well if you do a lot of mixing or just a lot of uh, audio editing. Uh, so anyway, so I went through and I just chopped up all of the silence, got rid of that. And then I was left with all these beautiful chunks. And then what I did is I just started playing. Um, and if you flip over to my left screen here, you'll see that I have all of my mixing set up. Um, and I try to be as organized as possible. I like to either go in alphabetical order or maybe by instrument type. And the most important thing for me to start a mix is to try and just get a basic level set. So for example, I knew that uh, like my hurdy-gurdy, for example, is a very, very loud instrument. So if I were to solo just that bit, you'll know what I'm talking about. So I knew right off the bat that an EQ is gonna be pretty essential to try to get some of that nasally tone out of there, to get some of the low end out. And I just started picking on certain instruments like that, that I knew just need a little bit of EQ. And so you'll notice that there's an EQ on almost every single track. Not everyone, but most. Anything that I felt just needed to be more high end, like, like uh, get rid of the low end to create the high end, or get rid of the high end to create the low end, just to kind of section everything off to it has more space. And then I think the second most important tip in any mix is to make sure that your panning is taken care of. So you'll notice that in my mixing window here, I don't do a lot of panning, but the panning I do is very effective. So you'll notice like right here, my lute, which is plucked, which is this guy down here. Let me solo that so you can hear it. Like in this section over here.
that's just a, a little cool little um, idea on the side. So I want to make sure that that has its own little pan. It's not in the middle. It needs to be on one of the sides so that all the melodic content can hang out right in the middle. Um, so I did that for a few tracks, not a ton, but you'll notice, for example, like these uh, violins, I, I recorded three of them. And so they all have these little uh, colinio, little hitting on the, uh, with the wood of the bow on the strings, these kind of noises. So I actually took all three of my recordings. You'll notice I grouped them together and I panned them left, right, and center. That way all three kind of take up a little bit more of the space, a little bit more of the, the stereo image there. Um, and for this particular track, I believe that's all that I did as far as panning goes. Like I didn't get super detailed. I just knew that those particular instruments needed to have a little bit more space versus the others. Um, otherwise everything else is just stereo centered. So really the huge challenge for this track is I was recording, we recorded a live choir in, in Hungary um, and by itself, it would take all the plugins off. Which will take a second, I got quite a few here. So go to my master track, turn all those off. The, um, the choir itself sounds very fat and beautiful. But you'll notice in a second when I take, um, when I take it off solo, listen to how quickly that one, that beautiful choir gets drowned in a sea of noise without any plugins. Here's what it sounds like. You just can't hear it. And worse, even if I were to just crank up the volume, here's what happens. You're gonna notice something. see that it starts to crack it starts to uh, sound very very rigid and it, it literally has the pops um, because I have reached a hundred percent maximum volume for that choir but there there's no dynamic range anymore so really the only solution is to use a compressor because that's going to take the highest loudest notes and it's going to kind of squish them down a little bit so I just used a pro C from fab filter very basic threshold and ratio just to kind of squish it down. I did that on the release in particular. And even just that one move makes a significant difference when we get to the loudest sections. Here it is without it. Oops. It's not controlled. So that compressor does a lot. Same thing, a, an EQ did a significant amount of um, amazing damage on this because this is a very extreme EQ. I don't usually boost things, but in this case, I needed to boost the lows, boost the highs and boost the mids a little bit, but take off the extreme highs and extreme lows. And that one thing allows it to soar above the rest of the mix and to sound really good. Isn't that amazing? And then to give it the volume, I put an L3 Ultra Maximizer, which helps a lot with um, giving it more volume. In this case, negative 14, but I squished it down to where my ceiling is not so high, negative 2.5. And that way you put all those things together and you get a very loud sound, but a very controlled, clean sound. And so, that was really the one instrument that gave me the most trouble, but once I conquered that, everything started to fit in place. And so on the master bus, after you know, I did some basic compression and um, EQs of these instruments, because there's a lot going on here, my master channel, this really made some big differences here. Um, and I'll try to fly through this, but if I just play maybe a loud section without them, it sounds like this. <laughs> Okay, sounds okay. It's just very crammed. There's a lot of information in the middle and there, you can't make much sense of it. Because my goal as a mixer, as a composer, is if you listen to pick out any instrument in the mix, pick out the dulcimer, pick out the choir, pick out the cello, pick out the accordion, you should be able to hear it. You should be able to hear just that line isolated by itself. And of course, in the context of everything. Um, so that's my goal. So in order to achieve that, we got to use a few plugins. So I've talked about these at length in other 
um, videos, but the idea here is um, just to kind of check these out. So the first one I used was Center by Waves. This allows me to keep my center the same, but my sides I have boosted up a little bit, only 1.5 dB. And the, way, the reason this does something is I've made all of my low material go on the center, all of my high material go to the sides. So what that does is it pushes the sides a little bit more out and I boosted them up. Now it sounds like this. It makes a huge difference. But probably the biggest difference of all is using a compressor on the entire track. I use an API 2500. And with this, this makes a huge difference because my threshold is very low, my attack is very low, my ratio is low, my release is high. So what that has allowed me to do is create this medium tone. Um, make sure that if you use this plug and you actually turn the on button, hit the in button or else nothing happens, this green light. And essentially with the analog toggle on, it gives it a lot of warmth and it squishes down everything just enough to be really clear. Here it is. <laughs> Gives a lot of warmth to the mix. The next one is the API 550B. It's an EQ that I put. It's kind of the sister of the API 2500. And what I've done is I've done a slight boost to the bottom. I'm sorry, this is the highs. So a slight boost to the highs, slight boost to the lows, and a slight negative to the mids. Same thing, turn the analog button on. Sounds like this, even warmer. <laughs> Really, that final glue to make it sparkle is to add the Kramer tape. And you can already hear in the background, it's a little hiss. And this is real room noise of orchestral halls. So you add that and you add the NLS bus. And it's just a tiny little bit of uh, room noise that helps give it a little bit more character. Sounds like this. <laughs> Same thing is just to put a uh, kind of a, a final EQ to get rid of the highs and the lows, any artifacts that may have come, and then a limiter, a brick wall limiter at negative 0.1. That way the final volume is set to negative 0.1 and we're good to go. Now it sounds like this. And what's cool about taking care of the loudest sections of a track is it means that the soft is usually gonna work pretty well too. So if I go to a softer section. I think it works extremely well. Um, so I'm very happy with that. And then just, I took my time, I walked through the track and any section that I thought needed a little bit of this instrument, a bit more, a little bit less of this instrument, I just took that very specific region within Pro Tools. For example, like right here, this hurdy-gurdy melody really needed to, to be quiet. So I took this and I drug it down to negative 3.8. And versus this section, I wanted it to be back at the normal volume, so I cranked that one back up to zero. And then I did a crossfade between the two sections. In Pro Tools, you do that by pushing Control F. It brings up the crossfade menu. Hit OK, and it creates a beautiful crossfade that the volumes can cross without any pops or disturbance or silence or anything like that. And that's basically it. So this, it wasn't a particularly challenging mix, but you just gotta go slow. You gotta build it one layer at a time. So when I did this, I would literally solo maybe just the drums, and then I would add the percussion, other elements, I would add like the harp, I would add the wood flute, I would add the violin, and then the melody. I just took my time and I built it slowly, slowly, slowly from the ground up, low bass information all the way up to the high melodic information, and we have ourselves a track. So the other section I wanted to show you before I play us out with the final track, I want to show you how I routed this for stems. Um, the first most important part here is I chose to send each of my tracks a certain percentage amount to a reverb aux. So the green track is an aux track. You can create those with control shift in. You can create a stereo aux input. That's what that is. And what you do is you set the input to be a bus of your choice. In this case, I just chose bus one, two. And then my output is going to be my audio interface. That's normal for any mix. But what I've done is for every single instrument, I, underneath my sends, I've created a send to the reverb. And that way, this choir has a negative 14.2 send 
to the reverb track. And that way I can control at any point how much is being sent to the reverb. Um, this is very powerful because now I only have to have one reverb for the entire track. And I just go to every single little instrument and I send it the amount that I want it. They're all different, just depends. But now they all feel like they're in one space. Very efficient way to use your resources. But when we're creating stems, I decided that I want a separate reverb stem. That way it has nothing to do with the track and the producer and the director uh, for this project, they can choose however much reverb they actually want by lowering or, or increasing that reverb audio file, which is pretty cool. It's very powerful. So the way that I did this is I very simply control shift in to create new tracks. I created a bunch of audio tracks. So I counted how many instruments I had. I think it's like 34. So I hit 34 and I hit create. And so it put all believe I'll show you right here. So here's my master. So everything below that point, these are all my new audio files, my, my audio tracks. And just like that, and let me show you what's about to happen to make this really fast and easy. Um, so these were all blank when I entered it in like that. Um, cool. And so all I had to do to make the stem portion happen is I then went to my first track choir and I select all the tracks that I want to create a stems. I shift click all of them and now you can kind of see in my track list how they're all selected. Um, and it's a very easy process. I was shocked by how easy this was to do. And then what we do is we go over here to the output and I hit shift, alt, control. That's the Pro Tools command, shift, alt, control. What it means is whatever I set the first track to, it's going to set every track beneath it to the very next sequential item. So if I set the first one to bus one, one dash two, then the second track is going to go to three, four. The next one's going to go to five, six. And so it just automatically puts them all sequentially. So let's do that. So I'm going to hold alt control shift, go to out, uh, sorry, go to bus. And I'm just going to start somewhere. Let's just start at nine, 10. Actually, uh, I forgot something. I for, I'm supposed to click on reverb as well. My bad. So if you're following this step by step, make sure you control, uh, you select reverb in that list because it's just another track, right? So we're gonna go to the reverb one, hit Alt Control Shift, and then go to Bus. Choose whatever bus I want to start on. Let's just do 910 and watch the magic. Boom. And now this is 910. This is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down for the ones that I selected. And now all I have to do is name every single one of these tracks, whatever the heck I want to name them. I like organization, so I went ahead and, and went through and double clicked and put stem underscore reverb. Hit control down to go to my next one and that I can name that stem choir. Stem accordion main, blah, 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 and just go through all of them like that. And then all I have to do is select every single one of them, do the exact same process where I'm going to go to my input, go to bus, hit the exact same one. And now, make sure I do that in order like that. And because I'm holding Alt, Control, Shift, all of them in order have now created their association with the original instruments. Final step here is to make sure they should already be, but all of these should have an output set to your stereo out. And that way, if you have a master channel that has all your plugins on it for the whole piece, it is associated with both the original track, all the instruments, and all of the stems. So now the end result, all I have to do is push record button on all of these. So let's select them all. Let's hold Alt Shift so that we can click and now they're all record enabled. Just go to the beginning of the track, hit my record button up here and watch the magic happen.
once you're done, you hit space bar. It does take a second to load because it's actually going through and creating a separate audio region for every single track. So your clip list just like doubled. But look, there it is, just right there. They're now done. So the way that we get rid of these it's very easy. You just go through and shift click every single stem that you want to export. You could skip one if you want like that. I didn't want that one. I didn't want that one. I wanted that one. You just kind of go through and pick all the ones that you want. Let's say I just wanted those. Then look, they're all highlighted on my clip list. So then you go to any one of these, you right click, you go to export clips as files and boom you export them you can export them as mp3s as wave files you can choose everything you need to about them hit export and then depending on how fast your computer is in my case these are four minute tracks and they're all very heavy at 48k um, 24 bit uh, to export 30 about 34 stems it took maybe one minute to export all of them um, and all I had to do was sit through it once, the four minute length for all of them to record, to be posted and pasted on there. That's a good deal. That is so much easier than going through and exporting every single one, one at a time. Um, and it just does, it's not very helpful to do it any other way. So I'm very glad that I finally figured out how to do this routing. And I hope that this is helpful for you guys. Um, and so with that, you know, uh, that completes my session and this allows me to kind of have the original files as well as the stems and I can change them however I want to just gives me a lot of control and to answer your question by chance in the audience he says is this the Bloodborne type thing you made a while ago yes it is this is one of the two tracks that I wrote in that Bloodborne style um, and they're actually both now a, a part of the Dark Dice podcast so if you listen to that you'll hear this throughout the stories um, because it's a four minute loop and the producer wanted to have stems so that he could go through and make it much, much longer because these are like hour long episodes. So what he wanted to do was maybe loop it a few times or even just take a bunch of instruments out or maybe just have a few instruments playing or create a new intro out of them, uh, maybe create more loop points. So there's a lot, it's kind of like a video game in a way that you give one you know, package of materials, but the stems give a lot of power um, creative power to the creative team, which I, I love. I get to do my job once and then they have materials that last them so much longer than just one four minute trek. So I'm very happy about this. So cool. If this is helpful for you guys, let me know. I'm going to uh, close this live stream by playing the final track so everyone can hear it. But in order to do that, I, ha I do have to set all of my channels back to stereo out, or I could just hit the record button, but you kind of get my point. Um, I just hit output, put it back on stereo out, and make sure that, um, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. Everything is, is routed back properly. Um, so I can just hit play. But be extra careful if you did record stems that you're not playing both at the same time. So in this situation, I would just highlight those, turn the record enable off, put the mute buttons back on. That way they can kind of sit there in peace. Um, and not really mess anything up, but it's just a very quick way to have control over all of your stems and uh, It's been very helpful for me and it has saved me literally hours upon hours of exporting time um, And you can do this in any DAW. It's not restricted to Pro Tools, but that's my favorite way of doing it So I hope this was uh, valuable for you guys um, As always hit that like button subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet for more content like this to help you in your composition and production journey so it's been a pleasure. Let's play out the final track and I will see you guys next time. Thanks for jumping in.